Good morning. It's Friday, the sixth of December, and this is Govind Raj Jyoti Raj, headquartered and broadcasting and streaming from Mumbai, India's financial capital. The top stories and themes as we go into this weekend: foreign institutional investors kick off a three thousand point surge in the Sensex in a hot December. The rupee is projected to go below eighty five rupees to the US dollar, according to a Reuters poll. Low air cargo capacity out of India will constrain smartphone exports. Sugar prices have fallen sharply, and then understanding Masayoshi Son, the man behind SoftBank, through the eyes of his former vice president. This is a core report with Govind Raj Ethiraj. The market surge, three thousand points. The stock markets have resumed, if one may say so, their upward climb after an almost two-month break, or so it appears. While markets have risen in between, selling pressure has constantly kicked in. The data suggests that buying pressure, particularly from foreign portfolio investors who do determine sentiment and direction to a fair extent, has returned. This time in the upward direction, and despite the new year not having begun yet. Foreign institutional investors have been net buyers almost the second half of November onwards, at least looking at the data. And now, in five trading sessions, the Sensex has jumped nearly three thousand points, crossing the eighty-two thousand mark, and the Nifty has crossed the twenty-four thousand eight hundred mark, and thus edging closer to twenty-five thousand or back. The benchmark indices were up and then down on Thursday. That's once again, but continue to close on the higher side as the buying pressure that we referred to was higher rather than selling. The benchmark indices were up and then down on Thursday once again, but continue to close on the higher side as buying pressure, like we've referred to in the past, is now higher than selling pressure. The Sensex closed 809 points higher at 81,765. NSE Nifty 50 was up 240 points to 24,708. IT stocks or information technology stocks rose on the back of a strong U.S. economy, while financials extended their rally to a fifth session. On hopes of domestic policy easing, according to Reuters. Now there is some expectation of an interest rate cut today by the Reserve Bank of India, but it's only some, and not all economists who agree or concur on this, including some we spoke to who feel that there is a greater likelihood of liquidity easing measures through reduction of the cash reserve ratio rather than an interest rate cut right now, because that, among other things, would take some time to transmit anyways. Now the question of an interest rate cut assumes importance in the light of. Slower GDP numbers or gross domestic product numbers for the latest quarter, which came in at 5.4 percent, that was below expectations and projections. Speaking of interest rates, IT stocks who earn more than 60 percent of their revenue from the United States rose yesterday after Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said that the U.S. economy remained stronger now than expected in September. This obviously means or could mean that companies like Banks and financial services sector companies in the United States could spend more on IT. Elsewhere, foreign investors have stepped up buying of Indian government bonds in the last four sessions after weaker than expected economic growth data last week triggered expectations of monetary policy easing by the central bank, according to Reuters. Though, of course, like we said, that expectation of that easing is not widely held. The investors who are presumably expecting a rate cut have bought bonds over nine thousand crore rupees, or just over a billion dollars. Foreign investors, says Reuters, had sold bonds for most of November, and that is the time U.S. yields have also remained high. The rupee is expected to stay down. The Indian rupee will break through 85 rupees to a dollar to hit a new low in the next six months, even as the Reserve Bank of India continues to intervene to stem the currency's losses, according to a poll of foreign exchange strategists done by Reuters. The poll conducted between December 2nd and 4th forecasts the rupee to trade around 84 rupees 85 paise to the dollar to 85 rupees 12 paise to the dollar in the next three to six months. According to the median number arrived at by these surveys, now the number that is the rupee was trading at about 84 rupees 72 paise on Wednesday. According to one strategist, the only way for the U.S. dollar Indian rupee is weaker, and this time around, it's even more pressing for two reasons. One is the external headwinds, and the second is the domestic macro mix, which has changed to the worse. Incoming President Donald Trump's proposed tariffs, which are widely expected to create more inflation in the United States, have pushed up the dollar by nearly six percent since October, which of course affects currencies across the board, including in Asia. 
Reuters reports that since early October, the Reserve Bank of India has spent nearly $50 billion from its reserves to shield the rupee from the dollar's relentless strength. But despite that, it has constantly come down or weakened. Remember, this is also the period, that's the last two months, that foreign investors have pulled out more than $13 billion. Median forecasts showed that the rupee would weaken about 1% to 85 rupees 49 paise to the dollar in a year, and expectations are ranging from 82 rupees 17 paise to 88 rupees. Presumably, that's the worst case. The trade weighted real effective exchange rate, or REER, shows the rupee is overvalued by around 7%, according to Reserve Bank of India data, something economists and forex specialists that the core report has been speaking to have been pointing out as well. No production cuts in the offing. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries Plus, or the OPEC, Oil Producers Alliance has postponed plans to unwind several formal and voluntary crude production cuts into 2026 thanks to a lukewarm outlook for global demand, according to delegate sources and internal documents, reports CNBC. Under its formal output strategy, the broader OPEC coalition is now restricting its combined production to about 39 million barrels a day until December 31st, 2026. So that's two years from now, after previously applying this quota through 2025 only. Eight OPEC Plus members will now extend their 2.2 million barrel per day voluntary production decline into the first quarter and will then begin hiking production incrementally between April and September 26. The problem, of course, is on the demand side with prices staying subdued, including right now under $73 per barrel, despite the fact that geopolitical tensions continue to rule. Not to be forgotten is President-elect Donald Trump's campaign promise to step up drilling, which of course could play havoc with prices, hurting the very American oil companies he ostensibly wants to do good for. Analysts told CNBC that in their view, the fundamentals for oil prices remain weak and the risks to prices are skewed to the downside. India has a cargo capacity problem. India has very big smartphone export ambitions, but there is a fundamental problem. Cargo capacity to carry those phones out of India and then some old problems, including particularly delays at customs. Last month, the Indian Cellular and Electronics Association raised concerns with the government about infrastructure challenges at the country's airports, highlighting the need to expand airport capacity and improve cargo turnaround times. The principal advisor to that Indian Cellular and Electronics Association told my colleague Zinal Dedia, that's at the core, that they often faced situations where there's simply no space to unload cargo, which adds unnecessary delays to the shipment. And then there is the inspection and customs clearance process, which extends time further. And this is a system that needs efficiency every step, he told my colleague. India smartphones exports, valued at about $10 billion in 22-23, have increased or climbed thanks to factors like the production-linked initiative or PLI schemes, apart from the more overriding umbrella schemes like Make in India and enticing companies to shift production from China to India. But the problem is logistical bottlenecks, which threaten to hinder further growth for smartphone companies, which include names like Foxconn, Pegatron, Tata Electronics and Samsung, who all manufacture and export from India, including from places like Delhi, Bangalore and Chennai, who are struggling with limited cargo infrastructure. There is another problem, which is the lack of dedicated freighters, aircraft that are designed to just carry cargo, which makes these issues worse, as most electronic shipments today depend on the belly space of passenger aircraft. In comparison, countries like China rely on well-established freighter networks, enabling them to dominate global smartphone exports. While there are freighters coming in to and going out of India, they're just not enough. So with India projected to achieve $14 billion in smartphone exports next year, experts said that investment in cargo infrastructure at all levels is vital to sustain this momentum. Sugar prices are down. Sugar prices have fallen to their lowest level in a year and a half thanks to excess supplies. Now, this has made it difficult for mills to pay farmers the cane price as the crushing season gains momentum, which starts about now or started about last month, industry officials told Reuters. Sugar prices have fallen below the cost of production, which makes it difficult for mills to pay the revised cane price unless sugar prices rise, the president of the West Indian Sugar Mills Association told Reuters. And wholesale sugar prices in Kolhapur in Western Maharashtra have fallen nearly 8% in the last four months. 
to about 33,000 rupees per ton, which is the lowest since June 2023. An official at the Bombay Sugar Merchants Association also told Reuters that sugar prices are falling as demand has decreased after the festival season and new season supplies have begun. And before we go, we have an excerpt of an interview that's coming up in a few days with Alok Sama, the author of a memoir, The Money Trap, Lost Illusion Inside the Tech Bubble. Sama was previously president and CFO of SoftBank Group International, that's SBGI, and chief strategy officer for SoftBank Group, also being the company's or the group that invested in high-profile ventures in India like Oyo, where the outcomes arguably have not been as high-profile, at least till date. Most of SoftBank's high-visibility investments have been led by Masayoshi Son, the founder of the Japan-based fund. I asked Sama, a former senior managing director at Morgan Stanley, who worked closely with Masayoshi Son, about working with him and how he would describe his former boss. The way he described himself is probably the best way to understand him. He calls himself the crazy guy who lives in the future or crazy guy who bets on the future. So he's a futurist in that term, futurist, visionary. It's used a little bit. Usually, uh, in, you know, in the Indian context, I don't know how many people you'd put in that category, maybe Dhiru Ambani. I mean, there's only a handful of people, right? And they come along once every few decades, literally. So he's one of those people, right? He's iconic in that way. And he's proven that time and time again, foreseeing the smartphone revolution, uh, the internet disruption, and now AI. And betting big time, monumentally by any standards, on those disruptive changes in technology. So that's the most important characteristic. On a more personal basis, I found him to be charming, engaging, funny. We had a lot of fun together, a lot of laughs with him. The other, more business characteristic, actually, maybe that should have come second. A lot of visionaries, you think that big picture people don't focus on the detail. His focus on, as an operator, on, on operating details can be microscopic. I described this incident where there's a defect, a blind spot in Sprint, and Sprint was a phone company in the U.S. that uh, SoftBank owned, that there's a blind spot there. You know, He will work with his engineers, identify it, go tell the Sprint people to fix it. That degree of focus is very unusual to see. When you say blind spot, you mean somewhere where the signal is not available. There's no coverage, there's no signal, right? So that kind of focus is rare, or you don't normally associate that with people who you kind of think of as big picture visionaries. And that's very unusual. Because he was also an inventor and a technologist. Yes, yeah, he has. Uh, I haven't got back and like fact check this, but if I'm not mistaken, used to be, I think the number was 350 patterns and it's probably more by now. But yes, I mean, he's a, he's a technologist in the true sense. The full edition of that conversation with Alok Sama is coming up in our new segment. It's called the Core Report Business Books. And we'll have several business books, particularly going into the year end. And we have some very interesting ones coming up, including one on artificial intelligence. And before we go, here's some feedback from all of you. The first one is from N. Jen, who says that you as the real estate expert meant the premium real estate segment is topping out. While both of you use the word or the term bottoming out more than once. But what he said suggested the segment is topping out. So I'm confused. Maybe I missed something. So that's a good point. When we say bottoming out, we mean something is stopping growth or things are not growing faster or the growth has slowed down. So technically, you're right. In the case of real estate, the prices have topped out and it appears that they may not rise further. But colloquially, I guess when we talk about markets or anything, we use the term bottoming out. But you're absolutely right. If one were to look at it literally, the real estate segment, at least the premium end, is topping out or at least that's what the experts are saying. Thanks for that. Shailendra says, any views on the Reserve Bank of India handing over the task to control food inflation to other bodies like NABAD, which is the National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, which he feels would be much efficient in tackling supply constraints of food items. And if done so, maybe the spillover inflation would be accepted, so maybe reduced. So uh, I'm not sure about this. So the National Bank of Agriculture and Rural Development's job is essentially supervisory and to control banking institutions, which is regional rural banks and state cooperative banks and so on. And the problem of food inflation is driven mostly by vegetable prices, for example, and within that, let's say tomatoes, onions and potatoes. Most people we speak to point out that the problem is really twofold. One is, of course, whether the farmers are being incentivized rightly 
and at the right time to grow those crops. And the second is supply chain. For example, tomatoes could be produced, but if they're not stored well, then their distribution cannot be staggered, which means prices can go up and down as the crops come into the market or do not come into the market. So it's a little complex, but it's something that one can, or I should, I guess, reach out to someone and explore as a thought. Sahil Arora says, very insightful conversations both. It's a crime, your channel. Uh, he's referring to YouTube, doesn't have a lot of views. And he says, maybe YouTube will take note and recommend it to people. Thank you for that, Sahil. And thank you for that encouraging comment. We do get a lot of views. Actually, our sense is that our most dedicated listenership is actually on Spotify and Apple. And we're, of course, happy that you're listening in on YouTube. And we do have a lot of video coming out on YouTube as well. Anyway, Sahil, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you all for your comments and views and have a great weekend ahead and see you next week. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopsis or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening. <laughs>